Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. By the name of Clay Elliott purchased a home and its numerous acres in the small town of Amite, Louisiana. He and his wife Flora were descendants of the first settlers in this area and felt that rural Louisiana was the perfect place to raise a family. In 1908, tragedy struck in the form of a tornado that nearly destroyed their home. It was immediately rebuilt with the addition of this beautiful southern gallery enhanced by 15 hand-hewn cypress columns. This young lawyer quickly aspired to politics and served as mayor and state senator representing his district. Later, he was elected judge over a three parish area and by 1922 was sitting on the First Circuit Court of Appeals where he served out his remaining years. The name Judge Clay Elliott would become synonymous with an area of Louisiana called the Florida Parishes. After his death in 1942, the home changed hands within the family and later fell into neglect. Luckily, in 1982, his granddaughter Flora and her husband Joe Landwehr decided it was time to return to her family roots and restoration immediately began on this magnificent home in the country. I'm Chef John Fultz. Welcome to Meet Louisiana and to Elliott House. This lovely historic home on North Duncan Avenue is now a popular bed and breakfast nestled among oaks, pines, and camellias. After a hundred years in the same family, this spacious but cozy residence has been converted into a rare country retreat. Elegant yet informal, the dining room complete with antique heirlooms is the perfect place for friends to gather, especially when Flora serves her magnificent cuisine, all fancied up with beautiful linens. Elliott House features original bedroom pieces from the family, including antique wicker and even the judge's traveling trunk. Imagine how happy Joe and Flora are to be able to share this mahogany Tista bedroom set with visitors staying overnight. It's been said that the rustic, manicured gardens of Elliott House reflect peace and quiet. Could Judge Elliott have known the beauty that his wife created for generations to come when she planted over 70 of these gorgeous flowering camellia bushes? Ah, oh, look how beautiful. I tell you, I wish all of you could have been with me at Elliott House to view those gorgeous camellias up close as I did. And you know, camellia bushes are kind of synonymous with Louisiana homes, plantation homes especially, because they were brought here at the, I guess the beginning of the 1800s uh, from Korea, from China, from Japan, and no one has done a better job of of uh, keeping those alive and well for visitors to see today uh, than Flora and her husband over at Elliott. And you know, I said a retreat in the country. Elliott House is so much more than a retreat in the country. It is uh, out about, let's say, 20, 30 minutes from the town of Hammond, only about an hour outside of Baton Rouge in New Orleans, perfect for the people trying to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. But yet, if you want to get to the city, it's only, what, about 30 minutes away. What a fantastic spot. And uh, what I really like about this area, it's, it's a different part of Louisiana. It's not Cajun country. It's not the 
Creole country of New Orleans. It's much more of the farm country of Louisiana. As I say, a great country estate. You have to go out and visit this place. It's absolutely beautiful. And what about the foods in that area? Well, the foods are a little bit different from Cajun country as well. You think of the hot, the spicy, you think of the robust flavors of New Orleans. Here you get out into this uh, uh, more English territory of Louisiana. It's really going to be uh, kind of a little twist in food. So one of the dishes that I picked up here at the house was a pecan pesto chicken, and I want to show you how to do it. First of all, on my platter, I have some nice debone skin on, of course, uh, uh, chicken breast. You may want to take the skin off if you're concerned about fats and all of those kind of things, but, uh, and it makes a great dish skin off. I also have oyster mushrooms right here, those wonderful mushrooms that we uh, find growing wild in Louisiana, and some basil leaves because I did say pesto, and I'm going to show you how to make that just a little bit later. Of course, pecans, and y'all, what about my pesto spoon? Keep your hands off of my little <laughs> pesto spoon right here. Hey, hand carved out of Louisiana Cypress. Okay, y'all, the first thing I'm going to do is season the chicken. Hey, do whatever you want. I'm going to put a little salt on it, a little pepper. If you want to put herbs, basil, and thyme, a little oregano, let your imagination go crazy. Now I'm going to bread it or coat it in a little lightly seasoned all-purpose flour. And again, this is going to give the nice little crispy coating on the outside of the chicken. Just dip it in and make sure you shake off all of the excess, y'all. You just want a nice little light coating. I have a couple of them already in my cast iron skillet over here. Just take a look at this. That nice uh, crispy coating on the skin. You can see it right here how nice that is. I'm going to kick up this flame a little bit to give us some nice heat. Now I need to season it. So how would I do that? Well, a little bit red onion. You can use Bermuda onion. You can use shallot. Shallots are really nice for this. Go ahead and put the uh, uh, shallots in or the Bermuda onions. Oyster mushrooms. If you can't find oyster mushrooms, which I doubt uh, that you won't be able to because most grocery stores have great oyster mushrooms today. And then uh, you can use just regular though. Just throw some button mushrooms in there. And then some extra garlic. Even though the pesto has nice garlic in it, go ahead and throw a little bit extra in. Now, y'all, I want to deglaze with a little bit white wine, just a little touch. Use a dry white wine. I always tell people to deglaze with the wine that you're having for dinner tonight. Now, a little chicken stock, just a little touch of chicken stock to give us some moisture in the skillet, and then heavy whipping cream. <laughs> That's right, heavy whipping cream in Louisiana. We want to definitely get a nice, uh, a nice robust uh, sauce here. It's going to cook really nicely too. So I'm going to let this uh, cook for just a second. Let's take a walk in uh, to my little, uh, my little uh, machine here, my little food processor. I have some great basil leaves in here already, and they're all nice and clean. And to make a pesto, you want to flavor this with a couple of ingredients. And in my little uh, uh, my little bowl here, I have some nice garlic cloves. I'm going to take about three or four full garlic cloves and put in here. I'm going to also put pecans. Uh, pesto is normally made with pine nuts. But let me tell you something. In Louisiana, we substitute pecans because we absolutely love pecans in, uh, in pesto. And then, of course, you all some great Parmesan cheese. The more, the merrier. Throw it in there. Now, go ahead and pulse it. Pulse it around to break up all of those nice ingredients and blend them well. And then, of course, fresh extra virgin olive oil. Only the best olive oil. Pour it in, and it's going to make your pesto. Woo! And just let this go right here. It's going to be really nice. And you can see how it comes together. Of course, I have some already done. If we come walk over here to the, uh, to the skillet, I'll add the pesto. And you know you can put this in the refrigerator in a jar. Just screw the lid real tight. It'll hold for about two or three weeks and the pesto is all of the herb flavor you need. So go ahead and put this down. Take a look at this sauce here, y'all, how beautiful that is. Put that pesto down in there like this. Mm, absolutely. I wish you could smell this. I know you can see that color of the sauce changing quickly. That chicken is nice and done. Now season it. Go ahead and season it with a little of your favorite spices. Again, remember the chicken is already seasoned with uh, salt and pepper. So is uh, 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 so is the pesto. It has a nice uh, garlic and all of that. But go ahead and throw some, uh, some other flavors in there if you wish. A little red and yellow bell pepper for color. Huh, look at that. Now, y'all, I want to plate it up for you. So what I'm going to do is kind of blend that in a little bit. I'm going to have a plate here, and I want you to take a look at my plate. I've combined a couple 
little pieces of angel hair pasta here. And then I'm gonna put one of these beautiful chicken breasts right on top of the pasta. Just like that. Boy, what a meal this is gonna be. And then I want a little bit of the sauce naturally, so go ahead and get some of that beautiful pesto, not only on top of the chicken, but around the chicken because it's your pasta sauce. Beautiful pesto. Let me put a little bit on top of there like that. Now I can just garnish it ever so lightly with a little purple or a little yellow or orange, whatever those colors are. I like coloring food, as you know. So take a look at that. Isn't that a beautiful little dish? I absolutely love it. Pesto chicken, y'all. Now, one of the next dishes that I found, Flora is absolutely fantastic with our caramel custards. And uh, I wanted to show you how simple it is because a lot of people have trouble with caramel custards. The first thing they have problem with is caramel. And what I like to do is take about a cup and a half or so of sugar and put a, a lot of people put about double the water to the sugar in a skillet, but I like to put a little bit less, just enough to melt the sugar. And I have some already on the uh, stove up here. Why don't we get a quick shot of this, uh, of this uh, sugar, of course, it's already uh, almost tight on me like a hard caramel at this point. It's been sitting on top of the fire. But look at these cups right here. The cups already have the nice caramel already poured into the custard cups right in front of you here. And you can see how nice and crystallized it is, really nice and golden, beautiful for custard. So I have here four eggs in the bottom of my bowl, and we're going to make a wonderful, simple egg custard. Four eggs whipped together, and once we've whipped these in, then I'm going to add a little bit sugar to it. Just add about a cup of sugar. You just want to sweeten it up, and of course, there's ways to eliminate the sugar, too, y'all. If you want to stay away from sugar uh, in your diet, you can use some of the substitutes in custard. Uh, you can also use low-fat milk if you're on a, a low-fat uh, uh, kick. That's very important. You can make it um, without the, all the heavy uh, eggs as well as some other uh, egg substitutes on the market. Okay, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt, vanilla. Mm. Got to have vanilla in here. And there's so many great vanillas on the market today, some of that great Mexican vanilla that gives it wonderful flavor. A little bit of cinnamon, a touch of nutmeg, as much as you want, but be careful. You don't want to get this so dark that it starts to discolor the, uh, the caramel. So, um, I mean, the custard. So go ahead and whip that in, and then about a cup and a half of heavy whipping cream, a cup of milk, just pour it right down into the custard, mix it well, and that's basically all to it. And this can be made ahead of time. This is the same custard we use for bread puddings, the same custard we use for, uh, well, a lot of the, uh, uh, the rice custards, the real lay, anything that requires just a really nice, simple custard is what we would use here. Now, the caramel uh, uh, is already in the cups, and I'm going to go ahead now and put in one or two ladles of my custard. Look how nice that is. Nice. And also, you want to let this sit, y'all, before you go into the uh, oven with it for all of the air bubbles to uh, just kind of uh, uh, disappear off of the top of that custard. Otherwise, you're going to have air bubbles cooking into the top of your custard, and it's not going to look that good, even though you're turning these custards over uh, to, to present them. Now, once I put them in the, uh, in the custard cups, I place them in a water bath. You want the water to come up about well, I guess halfway your custard cups. You put them in a 300 degree oven and you cook the custard for about two hours. Every oven is different. Don't call me up and say, hey, look, my custard burned and it's your fault. Hey, every oven's different. So play around with it a little bit, but about two hours at 300 degrees, slow cook it because if you overcook it, it's going to kind of get this, uh, oh, I don't know, all these little, uh, uh, almost like scramble eggs, y'all, because I remember there's a lot of eggs in this dish. Now, if you're lucky enough, as I am, <laughs> to know Joe and Flora Landwehr, you would probably be lucky enough to borrow her Victorian custard cups that her grandmother left at the home, and uh, of course she eventually got them. I'm going to try to twist her arm to see if she'll, you know, maybe leave them to me. You know, I'm not sure she will, but take a look at what the custard cups look like. Isn't this beautiful? Uh, nice uh, little. Uh, uh, the custard poured right into it, and of course, look at those silver bases. I put a little pecans to garnish the custard. They're absolutely beautiful. And of course, you could come back and put some blueberries or anything else on them. Now, y'all, we talked about the gardens at Elliott, magnificent gardens. Well, I went to one of the greatest guys, Lewis Miller, who's a horticulturist here in the Baton Rouge area, to tell me the importance of a garden in Louisiana. Let's listen to him. 
Lewis, we're sitting in front of this fabulous uh, little cottage garden here with hydrangeas and, of course, uh, uh, crepe myrtles. Mm -hmm. When did man first decide to control nature by building a garden? Well, John, I guess uh, back when they decided that they needed to have something to eat, they needed to keep from starving to death, <laughs> and they saw seeds fall to the ground and plants come up and got the idea, well, you know, we can do that. We can plant something. And, of course, uh, back the first plants that were planted, of course, weren't, weren't flowers. It wasn't, <laughs> wasn't floral gardening, but it was agriculture, and they were doing it simply for survival. Simply to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, as we go around the bed and breakfasts, we're at Elliott House today, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I look around and I, and, and I wonder, how important is a garden to a business like this? Oh, to a business? Well, I mean, it's a welcome sign is what it is. It's a welcome mat. It uh, shows that uh, you care. It's like having a nice sign out in front of a place of business. If, you know, if you go into a business and, the, and half the lights are out in the sign, and, uh, you know, a couple of the letters have fallen off. You wonder how well that business is run. Well, when you walk into a bed and breakfast and you see an attractive garden right out there in the front, you can, while you're checking in, the rest of your party can look in the garden. They'll see things maybe that they've never seen before. People from out of town, we've got a lot of Europeans come to Louisiana, and they'll see plants that they have never seen. How does one go about selecting the items for their garden? Well, there again, it's a reflection of the, the, of the person. Uh, you want to look, for instance, do you want something that's very structured? Do you want a theme? Um, I've seen some gardens that I found that were just absolutely adorable that really looked like a hodgepodge thrown together, uh, uh, just like you make a stew with everything in, right, the, right. in the refrigerator. And they've been just absolutely adorable. I think everybody has their own idea about what a garden should look like. Well, Lewis, thanks so much for being here with us today and sharing all of those great comments. We really appreciate it. And uh, by the way, I have a little garden project down at my home in uh, Gonzales this weekend. You doing anything? Uh, Saturday, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I thought Lewis Miller was my best friend, right? Was going to come out to my house and help with a little gardening. Yeah, all right, huh? Wait till he calls me to cook a meal for him one Saturday. Y'all, a couple of great dishes in addition to what we just cooked that I found out at Elliot as I spent the day there were two wonderful dishes I want to show you. First of all was this, uh, the spinach and rice casserole. This is spinach and rice and cheese all kind of cooked together and baked. What a nice side dish uh, this becomes. And then one of my favorite front porch carrot bisque. Front porch, why? That beautiful veranda in the front of uh, Elliot that I know you're going to want to sit on that beautiful swing and sip on a cup of this carrot bisque. Look at that gorgeous orange bisque. Of course, finished with a little cream. Everything's a little bit uh, uh, creamy and wonderful and rich, but of course, again, you can, uh, you can go ahead and tone that down with just a little bit of, um, of, um, of uh, skim milk. Now, talking about light, what about Flora's granola? She showed me how to make it, the best class I ever had. Flora, normally when I think of breakfast in a B&B &B in Louisiana, I think of, oh, a big platter of hams, ham, maybe some drop biscuits, or oh, a big, big thing of cheese, garlic, grits, of course, eggs, Benedict. Do people really come looking for granola? Well, they really come for all of those dishes. Uh, we serve all those rich dishes, but they really enjoy the granola. We usually have that on a buffet with fruit, and they usually take that first. <laughs> and they go right for Well, I guess they're coming out of New Orleans on many occasions where all that rich food has been pumped into their veins for the last week or so, so they're looking for something a little lighter, too. Right. Is this a recipe, uh, one of those family traditions that go back 100 years or so? No, this one came from one of my children way at college. She brought it home and taught us how to make it. And then when we started our bed and breakfast, we thought maybe our guests would like it since they're interested in health. And right, sure. Well, look, you gave me the recipe, and I've done it. And I want to share with everybody else exactly how to put it together. So why don't you help me out? You stir, and I'll go ahead and okay. dump in all the wet ingredients first. A little bit peanut butter, about a tablespoon, right? You can knock oh, a little okay. bit of that out for me. Okay, and I'll take that spoon from you. Now, a little bit uh, honey. This is about a half cup, but of course, uh, you were telling me that if people like things a little less sweet, they can go in with less honey, right? That's right. There you go. I'm going to just yes. do the way we do it in the salad. Mm. Mm. <laughs> 
Okay, now a half a cup of canola oil, and this really is a healthy oil as well. That's right. Can I blend all of that in there really, really, really right. good? That's going to be a nice blend. So all of those wet ingredients go in first, and then I can come in with about yeah, three cups. Right. Mm -hmm. Three cups of old-fashioned oats, right? That's Just right. Stir that in and blend it to coat real well. Flora, while you're starting that, I want to ask you a couple questions about the house. This house has been in your family for a hundred years. That's right. We used to come up and visit when we were grand when we were grandchildren of my grandparents who were still living here. And, and your mother was uh, born in the house as well. Yes, she grew up here, and uh, we we we've always just loved to come here and visit. In the, in the country. Now, at some point in time, you and your husband Joe decided that y'all would come back to Emmett after living all over the place and finally settling in Monroe, Louisiana. You decided that the country was calling. How did that happen? Well, we, we knew we would, uh, would retire in a few years, and uh, we both love Louisiana, and we thought we would enjoy this lovely old place once we restored it. <laughs> it needed a little work. Okay, well, that's all blending together pretty good. Now I'm going to put in a few more ingredients. I'm going to put in a little wheat germ here, and of course, again, you said about a half cup, right? That's right. About a half cup. Just to your taste, whatever whatever you like. Okay, and this right here is sunflower kernels or sunflower seeds. Yes. We can put those in there. And then a little wheat germ. Boy, I tell you, that, that stuff kind of gets thick after a minute, huh? That's right. It may need a little more oil. Well, okay, let me put a little bit more. I'll tell you what I'll put a little more of. I like honey. I like it That's sweet. Good. Let's stick it up a little bit more there with that good honey. Okay, up another All drip. Right. Mm, mm, mm. Really, really nice tasting. What condition was the house in when y'all uh, uh, arrived? Oh, it was in very, very bad uh, repair. And my aunt had lived here and was not able to maintain it. And we had to replace the roof. We had to replace the floor for the, uh, on the porch and some of, some of the other floors and pretty much redo the inside. Redo the whole house. Now, one of the things, the house, uh, the, the job that y'all did on this house is incredible. It's such a, a beautiful southern mansion. But you know what really catches my attention? As I drove in my little Thunderbird up the driveway, I couldn't help but notice the massive uh, azaleas, the camellias, the dogwoods in bloom. Who, who maintains all of this? And, and better yet, how old are those big old trees out there? Well, my grandmother planted these. They're at least 70 years old. And uh, she loved, uh, loved the yard and all the trees and plants. And uh, we have, my husband does a lot of the yard maintenance, and then he has very good help. Oh, he has good. Well, I tell you, you would need it. How many acres do you all have? About four acres oh, here. Oh, yeah, a lot. But uh, those trees are absolutely gorgeous. I could tell they were old. I didn't know exactly uh, how yes. old. Now, I see that the granola is coming together uh, real nicely. I have to ask you this question. Does anybody ever walk in the door and say, Floor, I'm here. I drove a hundred miles because I heard about your granola. <laughs> well, no, not exactly, but they usually leave, or many of them do, with a recipe because this is really my most sought after recipe. Is that right? Yes. And where, where do the guests come from? They come from really all over, but many come from right around here. They love to get to the country, go to the country, and um, some are traveling. Some, we're in a triple-A tour book, so they right. come from many reasons. I tell you what I was surprised of, you're only about an hour from downtown New Orleans, even though you see, you seem to be so far away in the country, you're about an hour away from Baton Rouge, and then about the same, I guess, maybe a little further from Jackson, Mississippi, right. but you're right in that, right in that corridor there. Uh, why do the guests tell you they come? Well, they come for peace and quiet, for the love of, of the history in the area and of the house, and uh, they love to get just have a weekend getaway, and they uh, they like the sort of the elegance we informal elegance we have here. And, and I'm sure they come for that granola too. Yes. <laughs> well, I know exactly why they come. I've been here. I've seen the house. I've walked the uh, uh, the yards, which is so beautiful, and I know exactly why I would come back. Now, when the granola is all done, you can add uh, you can add some pecans or some other nice. Uh, uh, nuts to it. We would right. bake this at 350 degrees for about 20 minutes. Anything else we would do with it? Well, we usually turn it in the middle to be sure it doesn't burn right, right. anywhere. And it gets golden brown. And then after you can store it in the refrigerator, how long does it last? Well, 
We never, we never throw any away because it's, uh, if our guests don't eat it, we do. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting me for a day here in the country. This is a wonderful, wonderful home. We really appreciate your hospitality. Well, we've loved having you, and this is a treat for us, oh, too. Well, thank you so Come much. Come back. And thanks to all of you for visiting as we continue to look up all of the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Now, 350, 20 minutes, and it lasts forever. To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folsom Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Foltz is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana, she's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. <laughs>